Joel Osteen gets support from a fallen pastor who calls people idiots for, quote, hating on Joel Osteen. And more and more parents are having a tougher time understanding their children's depression as it relates to their attachment with social media. Stay with us as we look at these and other stories on the 511 News. Now, there are two kinds of people in the world, only two kinds, not black and white, not rich and poor. There are those who are dead in sin and there are those who are dead to sin. After three nights of unbridled lawlessness across London, the contagion is spreading. The problem is that God has already judged this. He has judged murder already. I don't need to question it. I don't need to ask and wonder what his plan is. We're commanded as Christians not to participate in the works of darkness, but expose them. Welcome back to the 511 News. I'm your host, Chad Davidson of Good Fight Ministries. And on today's episode, we'll be discussing a number of topics, that which is supposed to be sacred and that which is also secular. And I believe, sadly enough, when it comes to one of the topics we're going to be discussing, it is quite secular, even though it is being pushed in front of us as if it is sacred. And to get us all started on that, I wanted to look into what recently took place in Houston, because at Joel Osteen's church, one of the reasons he's been all over the news again is the fact that a plumber recently was going there to do work. There was a loose tile there, and when he opened it, he found hundreds of thousands of dollars, I believe over 500 different envelopes with cash in it. And now the the church there, Lakewood, uh, pastored by Joel Osteen, has now given that man a $20,000 reward, the plumber, for being honest about what he found. And it is connected to something that took place, a robbery that took place there. Sadly, people don't realize that a robbery takes place there every time the preaching takes place and the money is taken from the people that attend there. But nonetheless, a robbery that took place where it seems as though those who were trying to get out all the money ended up dropping some of it there and hiding it behind that tile. And it ended up being over $200,000 in cash and over $400,000 in checks for what seemingly looks like a weekly giving and offering. And now this whole thing breaks my heart for a number of reasons. Uh, and most of it has to do with the fact that what's going on at Lakewood Church is really not a church in the sense that they are called out ones, the ecclesia of God, that are the called out ones, but merely an ecclesia that is just a building where there happens to be motivational speaking going on, where that motivational speaking leads people to say things that are very new agey, including the teachings as well from Joel Osteen. Now, before I get into any of that, I wanted to talk about this because— some people have come to his defense. Now, there are things online, a lot of people saying, hey, man, we've known this guy is a false teacher and so forth, all this money that they're finding there from this robbery that took place a number of years ago. But some people have come to his defense, and the one that probably perked my interest the most was none other than who I would call the infamous Perry Noble. For you guys who do not remember Perry Noble, Perry Noble was the pastor of New Spring Church in South Carolina. And in fact, while he was pastoring New Spring in South Carolina, that was the biggest church in South Carolina. But in July of 2016, he was let go of being the pastor of that church. Quote, the New Spring Board of Directors executive pastor Shane Duffy said, quote, a difficult and painful decision was made to remove Noble, adding that the founder was, quote, no longer qualified to serve as a pastor at the state's largest church. Duffy said that the termination came after Noble had made unfortunate choices and decisions that had caused concern among the members who had confronted Noble more than once in recent months about his alcohol use and his posture towards marriage. Now, that last line, I remember reading back into the story from 2016 when I was first reading what was going on. 
where all of a sudden his posture towards marriage was different back in 2016. And I find that to be very interesting in light of Hebrews, the 13th chapter. This is a very important letter for the church today. And it's sad because it does seem to be a letter that plenty of people do not like reading because of some of the warning passages in Hebrews. But I digress. And I want to talk about the things that we should lift up because in light of that book specifically, and what it says to us as believers, Hebrews 13, 4 says that marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. But the very thing that is being said there is marriage should be held in high honor among all. It should be greatly esteemed. And this is not for unbelievers. Marriage should be something that is esteemed in the church, that we lift it up for the beauty that it is, the mystery, the great mysterion that it is, that we also get to see that as somewhat of a picture, not somewhat, definitely a picture of our relationship with Christ, that a husband and wife are married one to another, cleave together until death do them part. And for us, we are, according to 2 Corinthians 11, betrothed to one Christ, that we are the bride of Christ, and we get to have Jesus Christ as our bridegroom. I mean, this is beautiful, and the reality is, when somebody is being pushed down, I mean, I'm sorry, not pushed down, someone is being asked to leave his post as a pastor because he has a wrong posture towards marriage, it kind of makes you wonder what was going on there. And truth be told, it wasn't long after, uh, I believe in the next year, that he did end up divorcing his wife. So obviously, he allowed some sort of situation. It could have been his porn use, which he admitted to, or his drunken as well, continued drunkenness as a drunkard uh, that led to that. And sadly, this is the case. This is the sad part is that when I read passages such as Romans chapter two, in Romans chapter two, it warns, uh, and I know it's talking about the Jews there and the Gentiles uh, as well, but specifically when it talks about just being a hypocrite, right? When you see, you say, do not lie, yet you lie. You say, do not steal, yet you steal. Could you imagine the situation that a pastor who is addicted to much wine, which guess what? Means you don't meet the qualifications for an elder. A pastor who is frequently doing the very thing that Jesus called adultery, looking at a woman upon with, with lust as you stare at pornography and so forth. And you're doing these things. And then you are either derelict of your duties because you cannot go up there and preach and tell someone you need to stay away from this. You need to cut your hand off, pluck out your eye when it comes to this sexual sin, when it comes to these sins that are going to ravage you. You're either derelict of your duties because you aren't fulfilling them in warning the brethren in Christ, Hebrews 13 specifically tells us, and Hebrews chapter 10, to encourage one another to love and good deeds. And you're not even warning the flock about where the enemy is coming in and how the route he is taken or you are warning them, you are speaking out against those things, but you are doing them yourself. This is so unbelievably dangerous, and no wonder, no wonder he was relieved of his duties. And it's really sad when you look into the, the whole situation, because he then remarried, and then, of course, like all these pastors that are quote-unquote pastors, I mean, they are they are shepherds in some form. They, the, they are the blind leading the blind into a ditch. And guys like him and others like him, they don't preach sound doctrine. He's the same one who said that, you know, there's no word command in the Hebrew, that the Ten Commandments are really just the sayings. They're not the commands of God. And, and this sort of nonsensical teaching, he's the same one who was caught and it looked like it came out very flippantly, and he tried to give an excuse afterwards. But I've seen the video, even though I know they've taken it down from everywhere, where it seemed like he used the N-word during a teaching while thinking he's just ad-libbing through a joke. And sadly, it seemed like it was just common to him, and he covered it up. And he's come out and spoke and used foul language when dealing with people that have come out and hated on him. So it's no wonder that birds of a heretical <laughs> nature flock together. Those birds of a feather will flock together. And when we have heretics preaching heresy, when we have men that are not qualified to be pastors standing up as if they are, it is no wonder 
that somebody like Perry Noble would come to Joel Osteen's defense when everyone is saying, look at all this money. And this is just me, guys. When I think about this, when I think about the hundreds of thousands of dollars that were taken from what could have been just a weekly given or regardless, right? The millions of people that over time have sent money there to Lakewood for no ministry at all. I I really get just brokenhearted picturing, you know, people that are deceived by him, uh, people that are deceived by these sorts of teachings, even Perry Noble as well, that he had the biggest church there in South Carolina. And that these, I, I picture ladies sending their money in, watching this stuff on TV. I say, picture them sending, thinking, if I give money to these false teachers, not that they know they're false teachers, but if they give money to them, they know they're going to be blessed from it. And I wonder how many have had their faith shipwrecked from those promises given, these, just say these I am statements, have these power of positive thinking, just say these statements over and over, I am victorious and I am this and I am that. And then when it didn't happen, how many faiths have been shipwrecked from guys like Joel Osteen, who is an absolute bruising and black eye to what is truly the body of Christ. He is the fake image that people see on TV and also and elsewhere that people will look at and they will see that and they will say, that's Christianity when you and I both know it's nowhere near that. But what it is, is talked about in the Bible. I will give Joel Osteen that. He is talked about in the Bible without a doubt. In fact, one place he's talked about, and same as Perry Noble, by the way, but one place he's talked about is in 2 Peter chapter 2, specifically verse 3, and I really do love the King James here. And it says, and through covetousness, they shall with feigned words make merchandise, make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation, damnation slumbereth not. I don't always get into the King James, but man, that is a good, good version for that text. And that is really, really heartbreaking to me. You know, before we did this show, we sat here praying for the people that are deceived by this, the people that think I just need to take my happy pill on Sunday and I'll be really happy now the rest of the week because he'll make me feel like every day is Friday and he'll make me feel like this is my best life now. And then I can just send him some money and I know the Lord will bless me. If I just send him some money and I send money to this place and send the, this money to Joel Osteen, then I will be blessed financially. And if I say these words and I have this positive thinking and I never say negative thoughts about me out loud because those words have power, then guess what? Then I'll have it all and I can have the cherry on top and Jesus can be right in that place, the cherry on top of my life rather than the, what Paul said in Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I'm crucified to that cross. My old ways are crucified. I pick up my cross and I carry it daily. And I do that by denying myself. I do that by recognizing how easy it is to stumble. Because then I wouldn't talk the way that guys like Joel Osteen, while he's giving flatter, you know, flatterous words, flatterous while he's giving flattering speeches and so forth to people, we, we need to recognize and see it for what it is and see it for how serious it is. That smile, while it looked nice on, it might look nice on TV, that smile lies behind it a tongue that is literally preaching perversity in light of what the scriptures teach. In fact, when you look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and chapter 4, and this should be important, especially if we're talking about pastoral roles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, the pastoral epistles, where Paul is literally telling Timothy and Titus, this is what it's supposed to look like. And by the way, Perry Noble never met those qualifications, nor does he now after having a public display of failure and now has no good standing with the outside community, nor does he teach sound doctrine or refute those who do not. And I'm going to prove that through his latest Facebook post, because when we look at these things and we see in 1 Timothy chapter 3, when Paul is talking to Timothy, and or I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3, when Paul is talking to Timothy and he is basically giving him his living eulogy of this is what's going to take place after I die 
And this, I'm going to die. I've finished my course. This is, these are his dying words to Timothy, similar to his dying words in terms of the last time he would see the church of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, where he tells them that ravenous wolves are going to come, not sparing the flock. And here in 1 Timothy 3, the first thing he does is talk about the word of God and the fact that it is able to save your soul. And that Timothy has had that dwelling in him from his own mother and grandmother. And then he tells him that that same word of God, that same seed, those same things, those same writings that God did when he is the one who put them out, he tells them that he is the one who did it in First Timothy or 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that God ultimately is the one who breathed it out. God is the one. Every scripture is God breathed, and it's used for correction and training in righteousness. It's used for exhortation. It's obviously, it's used for rebuke. Right? There's so many different things, and this is what the Word of God is used for. And then right after that, so the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. Do you know what Joel Osteen and guys like Perry Noble are adequately equipping people with? Just enough to simply be a guru. That's it. It's not to actually be adequately equipped for every good work so that you can follow and love the Lord Jesus Christ with all your hearts, soul, mind, and strength. That is not what it's doing. These words that he gives are are just flattering speeches of nonsense. And these were prophesied not only in 2 Peter, but also in 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, right after he talked about the Word of God, being the Scriptures being God-breathed and their usage, he then says this, he solemnly charged, he says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. So I just want to point this out. Before we get to these next succession of verses, he is charging him with everything. The presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. He is putting all that weight on the following statements. This is the charge from that power. Preach the word and be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. This is exactly what is going on. In fact, when we look at even Joel Osteen's book, Your Best Life Now, we find that he's really using what is known as in the new age as the law of attraction, which is really, I guess you'd have to give some credence there to Elena Blavatsky. That's really who you'd have to give credence to when it comes to, comes to this. He says that there's quote, there's a miracle in your mouth. This comes back to once again, this name it and claim it, blab it and grab it nonsense that is not Christian. It is simply new age guru nonsense. It's actually witchcraft practiced and labeled and wrapped up in a bow that says, I'm a Christian. And here is how you can practice witchcraft as a Christian without actually stating it. That's what this is. And in fact, you want to talk about it being new age? In another book, he writes, quote, the priceless seeds of greatness are inside of you. So really, it's not something outside where you need to be made new by God, by his power, where he comes and makes you a new creation, but it's really something inside of you. That's new age guru nonsense, and it is not the gospel. These are taking people away from the Gospels. This is what the Bible says about the Pharisees, that they themselves were keeping people from the kingdom of God, and they themselves will not enter. But what does Perry Noble do? Here's what Perry Noble says. This was on December 7th. Quote, going to go ahead and say it. Don't care who does or does not like it. But all the people I know or have met who hate on Joel Osteen are people who are, quote, angry, have too much time on their hands, should be examining their own life and not his, have never met him personally, personally, always take his teaching way out of context and are frankly idiots. Now I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop there because just that statement alone is just sinful as a believer. We don't call people idiots. That's not what the Bible says. In fact, 
Matthew 5, 21 through 22 says, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. We need to be careful because by your words, you shall be judged. By you, by your words, you shall be justified. And by your words, you shall be condemned. You need to pay, pay attention about the things that you say and typed as this was typed out and recognize that this is sinful behavior But it does tell me a lot about why someone who's already had a great fall, who didn't think, just as Joel Osteen, that it was really his job to teach sound doctrine or refute those who do not. And Joel Osteen has said a number of things in front of millions of people on live TV talking about, you know, people from India who don't really know Jesus, but they love God, saying he doesn't know and and he just knows they love God and when people challenged him on John 14, 6, he really didn't know how to answer, says, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Guys, these are not teachers of the gospel. These are people that are simply making merchandise of men. They need to be marked, they need to be avoided, and they do need to be prayed for. Because when you finish Second Peter, and you think about what is reserved for false teachers who do make the merchandise of men, who are covetousness, who do have covetousness, who do have a love for money, when you see what takes place for them, it's something I would not hope for on my worst enemy. And so pray that they would repent and turn, because it is a heartbreaking thing to watch them go up there, claim the name of Jesus, teach false teachings, and then have people like that back him up by sinning in the way he even backs up the sinful teaching that's coming out of there. And I want to point this out, and and I know I went kind of long on the first segment because it it was very important and something that breaks my heart seeing uh, people being taken advantage of. And while he was robbed, it's something he's been doing for a long time. I imagine Jesus would have no problem turning over some tables and saying that you made his father's house a den of robbers. But nonetheless, I, I was reading this recent story about a mother specifically who had no idea some of the depression and the things that are going on. And I want to read this for you. Sabine Polak got a call from the guidance counselor. Her 14-year-old daughter was struggling with depression and had contemplated suicide. Quote, I was completely floored. I had no clue she was even remotely down at all. When I asked her about it, she just kept saying she wanted to get away from it all. But I didn't know what that meant. And you see, her daughter has typically been glued to her phone and so forth. And she thought nothing is wrong and everything is just fine. And the reality is, is that this woman is 45 years old. And from my generation, um, right up to around there, now having younger children, especially growing up in adolescence and then growing up, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, all the way to uh, 25 or so. What they're saying is a lot of us didn't grow up as much sitting on our phones. That's not how we interacted. So understanding those things and then dealing with them with our children is somewhat foreign. In fact, in the article, it says Polak is among a generation of parents who did not spend their childhoods with social media apps and are now struggling to understand and navigate the potential harms that social media can have on their kids' mental health as they grow up. In interviews over the last month, nearly a dozen parents spoke with CNN Business about grappling with how to deal with teens who experience online harms such as bullying, body image issues, and pressures to always be liked. Most of the parents said that these issues either began or were exacerbated by the pandemic, a time when the children were isolated from friends, social media became a lifeline, and the amount of screen time increased. Now, this is a reality, but not even if that didn't happen, most kids are on their phone a lot in class. If you go to a place to grab grab maybe some Jamba Juice or something, guess what? Somebody behind the counter probably would be on their phone if you weren't right there in front of them and there's no one in the store. So this is a reality. So I wanted to look up a couple of things, a couple of studies about what social media does to the brain and how it reacts. And here was one that was done on neurogrow.com. It says, it provides immediate rewards in the form of a dopamine release, the happy hormone. Every time you post or get a notification from the app, the constant barrage of shallow rewards rewires your brain to want more of what caused that dopamine release, which leads to social media addiction. 
Studies show that the brain scans of heavy social media users look very similar to those addicted to drugs or gambling. Heavy social media users perform worse on cognitive tests, especially those that examine their attention and ability to multitask. Compared to moderate to light social media users, heavy users need to exert more effort to remain focused in the face of distraction. Researchers hypothesize that since social media is easily accessible and competes for your attention with the promise of perpetual new content, heavy social media users become less able to ignore distraction in general. Not only does this lead to poorer cognitive performance, but it shrinks parts of the brain associated with maintaining attention. The ability of the brain to change is called neuroplasticity and has a big effect on your attention and cognitive function. There were not these other studies back in 2019 that links it as well with suicide rate and so forth among teens. And this is, is the reality. And in fact, I, I want to bring this up because they said that when it comes to heavy social media users, that it looks very similar to those addicted to drugs or gambling. Now, I wanted to bring this out because I remember asking a very close friend of mine, somebody I was so, so we were best friends and I did not understand. And at the time I was not saved. I was a drunkard, but I did not understand. I couldn't comprehend how I could, you know, I could go and, and drink and so forth. And that was socially acceptable one. But my issue was I didn't understand why him, and he was the best wrestler I ever knew. And I asked him, how, how do you get involved doing heroin? Like, I, I don't understand it. You have everything going for you. You have a family who loves you. How do you get involved in it? And, you know, it was after we were in high school and, you know, our wrestling years had, had ended. And when he was expressing to me what it felt like and how it started with Oxycontin, and what he was expressing to me was the hero dynamic. And he said, when I would take a hit of Oxycontin, what I would feel was as if I had won the state championship, as if somebody is raising my hand and everyone is cheering for me and I am this big hero, kind of like the word heroin, right? Hero. And for somebody who that is the feeling you get while using it, while your life is in shambles. And every time you get sober, you then remember all of those feelings again, those feelings of, wait a second, I'm not a hero. And you you become depleted looking for the next hit and the next hit and the next hit to feel that arm raise of victory when you really never accomplished it. And this is how Satan gets you. This is how he grabs you, whether it's from a Facebook like, and yes, obviously heroin, uh, the dopamine hit off a, a shot of heroin and the dopamine hit off of a like on Facebook or Instagram are a little different. But the reality is, is Satan is using this I, in the same regards to pull you away and to give you a false hope. Just like alcohol, it, it, it warns, don't be drunk with wine would cause dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. The reason why it's because it's a counterfeit. These counterfeit dopamine hits, these count, counterfeit drugs that are used over and over again to build you up and make you high, all these things are counterfeit to what you can have in Christ. Do not trade. Do not trade. Please do not trade the stream of living water that God offers for a broken cistern that can't hold water. And turn to Jesus right now before it's too late. God bless you guys.